Perfect. Good. Yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to have me on your show podcast. Right. It's my pleasure. It's my right. pleasure, definitely. So, how are you, first of all? How are you dealing with this uh, Corona thing? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, uh, Germany has been, I live in Berlin. Germany has been in mm -hmm. lockdown since um, pretty much like the first week of March. So it's been quite long. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's like one of those things where you just have to wait it out. I don't particularly enjoy it, but there's going to be positive yeah. things coming out of it, I think. And where yeah. are you? Where are you right now? Uh, yes, I'm based in Athens, Greece. So yes, more or less the same lockdown? here. Yes, lockdown, we have a lockdown. So. Yeah. yeah, we are actually getting into the fourth week mm. in a row. But things are doing, you know, it's strange here because we live a, an abnormal situation in an abnormal situation, meaning that usually we Greeks as a state, we are the last, you know, ones who follow the things. But uh, currently it seems that we, act, we were really proactive. So things are, let's say, under control, but being very, you know, uh, step by step, uh, watching the the situation, the evolution of the COVID thing. But up to now, yeah. we're doing good. That's it. Good, important. Yeah, good to hear. So it didn't yeah. um, explode into like an Italian no. situation. No, no, okay. no, no, good, no. good to hear. So I think Jonathan, that you have, for once again, first of all, let me tell you that I'm following AJ. I was uh, I've been trained by you guys in Berlin. You have fantastic offices on the uh, on uh, Design Street Masterclass by D. Oh, Ah, great. November, cool to hear. Yes, on November 2018. And I also met Bruna. It was our first meeting with AJ, where we were both sharing a stage on a conference in Budapest about a oh, couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's how we came in touch. So cool. it's great. For once again, you're surprising us positively by sharing more things, more stuff. And this is really great. And thank you so much for doing this. I think yeah, it was a lot of effort. It. And you have introduced uh, a new book. Yeah? Yeah. And then yeah. the Workshop Playbook. And I think uh, that's the reason why we're here today, right? Here wow. it is. Here it is. La la la. Okay. <laughs> the workshop replacement. <laughs> yes. Let's go. I have a question for you, which is, I think, why another book, Jonathan? There yeah. Are plenty of them. Thousands <laughs> of them. And That's despite true. the books, if we Google, we can find any possible answers about how to facilitate or what to do, whatever. So why another book? I'm glad you asked that question, actually, because... Um, I was kind of asking myself that question, like, why would AJ and Smart have a book when we have all of the YouTube videos, yeah. we have everything out there already for free. Um, and the answer to that is honestly, one of the best ways that I learned, learned how to do what I do today. And one of the best like kind of things that I did over the last 10 years growing my business was honestly reading books. And I don't know what it is about the medium of books, because mm -hmm. for example, I think courses like online courses uh, and in-person training, you get a lot more practical advice. But there is something about a book that really helps you introduce you to a topic in a more, I don't know, like calm and structured way. Um, and the other thing is like, I, I just felt like there was this one thing we had not shared yet. And that thing was, we haven't shared how when a client calls us at AJ and Smart and they say, we have three hours, we've got 20 people, we need to do this, 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 and this, how we make custom workshops. We've mm -hmm. never shared that. And that's what this book is. It's essentially the framework for how to make custom workshops of any size, for any challenge, for any topic, for any company. And okay. so I just felt like, I just felt like, honestly, for me, this is the first thing in 10 years where I felt like, okay, that's a topic for a book. Perfect. Good. And, um, did you do you have in your book is it uh, also it is also covers the need that we currently all have running workshops by distance or from home or online or virtual name them as you like well obviously when i was writing the book i wasn't thinking about the coronavirus um yes. but the the principles in the book and the framework uh they don't really it doesn't matter whether it's in person or remote um so i'm not specifically talking about in-person workshops. I'm talking about problem solving and decision-making workshops, which, you know, we've been releasing a lot of content over the last few weeks about how to do all of that remotely. Um, but the book doesn't go into whether you do this in person or remote. It's almost like the principles and the framework for creating workshops. 
Okay, good. So, um, I, just to clarify something for the process of our interview, I've prepared some questions that has to do with the, the, the workshop thing and how to yep. help us and to really understand what's in your book. And I also have a couple of questions that has to do with uh, the current situation. And I, I would love to hear your view on coronavirus. Thing. Sure. So no problem. I will keep them for the end. Okay. So I will follow with the uh, questions about the workshop. So another question, I think a lot of us who are facilitating uh, workshops in any forms we face that is uh, how to handle different generations in a single workshop, meaning especially mm -hmm. when you deal with themes like design sprints or user experience, which are, let's say, a modern uh, era of business. And within your uh, participants, you have uh, Generation X or I, either Baby Boomers and Generation Z. So I think you are very experienced, so you got the question. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're, we're, we are running quite a lot of workshops every year. Um, some of these workshops have seven people. Some of these workshops have 250 people. Most of our clients are lar large corporates. So most of our clients have a pretty broad span of like people who've been in the company for 20 years and who are 65 years old and people who just joined right out of college who are 20. And I think the the idea is to try to use the correct terminology with the right people. So for example, maybe somebody who's working in the sales department um, doesn't really need to hear you talking about innovation and digital transformation. Mm -hmm. Rather, they want to hear about practical tools and practical systems for getting things done. So what I try to do when I'm in a mixed generation room, which is pretty much always, is understand that so certain people in that room don't like the idea that the thing that we're doing, for example, is called the design sprint. And so, you know, the first few slides that I will put up are all about setting expectations. This is not for designers. This is a universal problem solving system. This is something you can, you, you know, I even say the job of a workshopper, you could have worked 30 years ago, you could have worked 50 years ago, because what your job is as a workshopper is to bring groups of people together to get things done. And it doesn't really, so I'll give you one example, actually. Recently, I was yep. doing a workshop at a uh, consultant's, uh, consulting firm. And what I realized is that they didn't, they really didn't like the terminology of the decider. So mm -hmm. because their company was a flat hierarchy, I do this okay. because I really don't believe that it was a flat hierarchy, but you know, like whatever. Yep. Um, so one of the things that I did during the lunch break is I spoke to a couple of people and I was like, what's the challenge? Why, why don't you like this terminology? And it turned out that in their culture, uh, like the idea that one person could be a decider was really against their rules. And so, and, and this was very different. The older people felt very strongly about that. The younger people didn't care. But what I did is I changed the name of the decider in the second half of the workshop to project responsible and okay. they were fine with it. So I think, yeah. it, you know, I think it is just about empathizing with the people in the room, not assuming everyone cares about what you're talking about mm -hmm. and just trying to connect, almost try to connect with people on a core level. So a core is not mm -hmm. design sprints or innovation. A yeah. core is problem solving. And this system will help you get things done without being frustrated. Good. Great point. Thank you for this. And then another question, which is, uh, uh, yes, I think it's on the same topic or area. How to deal, how do you deal with resistance and fear of change when you run a workshop, especially when you tackle soft skills things or cultural things? Mm -hmm. You know, you go to a legacy business, they have, uh, they're familiar with the long run designing processes and the and a lot of levels of hierarchy, etc. How do you deal with the resistance of change? So keeping in mind, the, the number one thing to keep in mind is that you are going into this company, not as the hero, but as the guide. And this is something that's super important to keep in mind. If you go in there and say, hey, I have the solutions. Hey, we're going to change everything. Yeah. Hey, this is the new shit and everything else sucks then people will hate you and people will push back <laughs> yes. and people will not want to have you back in the room. Mm. If you go into the company and say, hey, I understand what corporate environments are like. I understand that it's very difficult to change things in corporate environments. And I understand that's also one of the strengths of your company. It's so big. It's so powerful that, of course, it's difficult to change things because you do not want to destroy the core business. So if you go in there and rather say, 
what I'm here to do is guide you through what you're already doing, but it's going to be less frustrating. It's going to be more enjoyable. You'll get to actually unlock your superpower when I'm in the room because I'm going to remove all of the politics. I'm going to remove all of the discussions and give you systems mm. to get work done, to make decisions faster, to solve problems, and to really allow yourself to really do what you're being paid for. So uh, that I go with the approach of I'm the guide. I'm not here with the answers, but what I'm here with is I'm here to show you the path to getting things done. Whereas when I was a bit younger and a bit more immature, I went in as the hero and I would try to punch my way through and what I've realized is that large corporates, um, you know, they're successful for a reason. They have, they are just big. You can't expect to change it from the inside out over a year. You can't even expect to change it over 10 years. So I focus on one team at a time. I don't try to change the entire company. I focus on the individuals within those teams and making their work lives better. If you can make the individuals work lives better, then you're going to keep getting rebooked. And other teams and other people will want to bring you into those teams. So I just don't try to force it anymore. I try to act as a guide, not as the hero. Perfect. And I think uh, I can connect with the next question, which is how to focus. Okay, when we go for a workshop, we have our process. We have prepared our tools and methodologies and our materials. But many times, uh, the question is how to focus on the impact to the people and not to our process. And what are, if you can ha- share with us a couple of techniques on how not to, you know, to waste, to lose the, the, the focus on the impact of the people, which actually this is the reason why we're there. And, and if, you know, just turn to our process and follow our steps and our timekeeping, et cetera. How do you balance yeah. this actually? Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, the, one of the core ideas behind the workshop or playbook is that you can create custom workshops for every client um, really, really easily. And so when we're going into a company, we try, even though you know, a company might book us to do a design sprint, which we have a very strict process for, we realize that it's humans in the room with us doing this process and that sometimes we have to break the rules just because the company itself or the people in the room are maybe not feeling comfortable or need to do something different. So for us, we, it's, I would say the important thing here is before you break the rules, it's good to have the foundation. It's good if you get very good at sticking to the rules and understanding every single step, then you can improvise and focus more on the people. I think in the beginning, when you're just starting out, you might focus a bit too much on the timing. I see that when people join AJ and Smart, the new facilitators, they're very um, like inflexible with the clients because they are scared about messing up the process. But the people who've been running the process for six months to a year, they now know how to improvise if the client needs us to improvise. So that might mean you know, doing a two hour long lightning demo session instead of 30 minutes, uh, adding in an extra exercise, removing an exercise, doing an extra call, adding in an extra day. I think it is important to not get too stuck into the dogma of processes. Mm-hmm. Um, but the cool thing is a process allows you to not have to think about the process. If you have a process, mm. the cool yeah. thing is actually, like when you have a process, you actually are doing, you're acting more human anyway, because you're not talking about how should we do this? How should we do this? How should we do this? You're not thinking you're about the tools. Yes. You're just doing it. Exactly. So yeah. I think just honestly having a strict process, having a, a framework, which you can sometimes improvise on, allows you really to just focus on the people in the room rather than the process. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. And um, again, in the same area, what are the three key factors for you in order to deliver a meaningful workshop? And I want to point out the word meaningful, not a good one or an effective one or a nice one, but a meaningful workshop up to three factors. Okay. I, don't know okay. If, yeah. I mean, I have never had this question, but I really like it. So I have to think about it. I think, I think the first thing is there does have to be a clear, tangible outcome. If there's no, if people leave the workshop at the end and it's like, Oh, cool. That was fun. But like, what do we do now? If, there, if, yeah. there's not, if that does not exist, it's like watching a movie and having no ending. Mm. So for me, okay. to have a meaning, meaningful workshop, there does actually have to be a very, very clear ending. Number two, I think I, I love to see, I feel like people need to have the aha moment mm-hmm. to have a meaningful workshop. I think they need to see the comparison between here's how you were working before And here's what a process like this can do for you. So sometimes what I'll do in a workshop is I'll have them 
um, try to solve a task, for example, really simple thing. Hey, everyone at each table, what I want you to do is come up with a design or like an idea for a new common area in this, uh, in this company. Mm. So like, what would be a great like way to design a new common area in this company where people can collaborate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just sketch it out or, or explain it to me at the end. And then I'll let them work for 30 minutes. By the end of the 30 minutes with no process, a lot of the teams haven't even started getting to the point where they come up with a concept yet. They're just arguing mm. and talking and talking and talking. And, that, and then I get them to present the ideas. Then I'll have them do the exact same thing again with a process, okay. but I'll give them half the amount of time. Or I'll give them a slightly different but similar task and give them half the amount of time and I'll use a process. And then, I, and then they get to see, holy crap, this is something that's powerful. So there's these aha moments. So they, ha they kind of, they, they basically see, here's the problem. Here's now something that can solve that problem. That would be yeah. number two. For me, the, the third thing is really trying to connect with the people in the room. And this is something that took me a long time to get good at. And this means having longer q a sessions um this means and like at the start of the workshop what i try to do is i try to do two things before i start workshops number one is i set the expectations i tell people the emotion the emotional roller coaster that they're going to go through over the next two days i'm going to say it's going to be frustrating it's going to be fun you're going to hate me you're going to think this is not going to work <laughs> etc and then the second thing is i ask them what do you expect to get out of this? What do you, and, and then I write that up so people feel heard. So I think for me, if the people, most workshops that I go to, it feels like the person running the workshop couldn't give less of a crap about being there and they're just reading out of their workshop book. Yeah. Um, what I try to do is make it clear that I'm customizing the experience to the people in the room so that there is an outcome that's meaning for the, meaningful for them. And I'll write these things up and I'll constantly refer to them. So when I'm about to do an exercise, I'll say, um, you know, Sarah, you said earlier that one of the biggest challenges that you have that you'd like to solve is this. Well, this exercise is going to be interesting for you. And I'm able to constantly bring it back to the people in the room. So those would be the three things um, that I would say would be super helpful. I, I even kind of forgot what they were, but those are the things I can think of right now. <laughs> no, no, that's very meaningful, actually. And I, I guess... Uh, I'm sure that you distinguish the, the word expectations from needs. What do you need? Yeah. Don't yeah. ask what do you need, but what do you expect? What do you, I Which even is, say, like, I, I, I sometimes phrase it as what would be the best case scenario of you walking out of this room tomorrow? Hmm. What would be the, what would be amazing for you? What would be, what would make this worth your time? Perfect. Good. Very nice. Next questions. Too. It's amazing the way that you respond to the questions. Seems, I mean, I'm talking know, really, all day long. So, <laughs> <laughs> just a comment, a quick comment. It's really. I, I was thinking of you now that I'm listening to you. That it's like you, uh, you're very, you have a very clear structure. Not it's like you have a very clear structure about what you do in a workshop. But at the same time, your descriptions on uh, and your answers are very flexible. It like being without a structure. Like right. And this is really interesting. <laughs> I think really. that's, that's if you have a structure and that's the thing about the book, the, the framework is super simple in the book. It's just four steps that you can follow for every single workshop. Mm -hmm. Once you have a framework, you can improvise. That's the thing. It's like yeah, once, yeah, a comedian, yeah. once a comedian knows the four main jokes they're going to tell, they can play in between those things. But if you go up completely empty, it's yeah. just a nightmare. Good. Very good point. So next question is, uh, it's a bit more technical. And uh, I would say, let's put also the, 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 the here and now, what we live now with the whole uh, virtual and online thing. What are the, the most, uh, uh, the best media to use in a training? If and what do you mean like the technology that we would use in a remote training? Yes, uh, or even though, yes, in the remote training, definitely it's important nowadays to, 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 to listen from your side, but also in the traditional uh, classroom training, what kind of materials you'd suggest to use that they have the best impact? Honestly, for us, like um, we tried, we tried a lot of different things. Uh, like we tried having really detailed slides, we tried handouts. Um, we've tried video, we've tried a lot of different things in the in-person space, but I think the best thing is show and tell, like literally yeah. instead of, instead of having slides that show how to do one of the exercises, just doing it in front of them and then having them do it and then doing it again. So what I do mm. now, instead of just having the slides is I set up all the exercises around the room 
And like I go to, from station to station to show them these things. So I honestly think just the least amount of abstraction between what you're teaching and what they're mm. supposed to do. So if you can literally show the physical post-its and physical exercise and do it in front of them, it always works better than having the slides up on the screen or a video of that happening. So right now I have a combo of, they have a handout which shows them how to do uh -huh. it. I do it in front of them and there's a slide up on screen. So those yeah. three things reduce the amount of questions a lot. Perfect. Perfect. Last question for the workshop thing is uh, what is for you the best preparation or the must do preparation to be ready mentally for the workshop? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question. So for me, the best thing you can do right now mentally before preparing a workshop, and this should be for the rest of your life, <laughs> is you should allow yourself to not be in the best mindset in a workshop. And what I mean by that is I used to get super nervous when I used to travel to a client and I would get jet lag and the workshop would be the next day. I would be super nervous all night that I wasn't sleeping and that I was feeling a bit sick and that I had a sniffle and that this is not Jonathan at his top game, right? They're not going to get Jonathan like the A plus version. They're getting the C version. And because of thinking that all night, I would sleep even less and put myself into a yeah. big amount of stress. And then the next day I would be super stressed and then I would do the workshop and everything would be fine. So now I, before a workshop, I assume I'll be nervous. I assume I won't sleep. I assume I might even be a bit sick because I'll be so stressed and I won't sleep. And I allow it. I basically allow myself to go through all of those things so that when I'm about to run a workshop, and also the other thing is, I also assume the projector won't work, work at the client's office. I also assume the slides won't work. I also assume the room will be too warm. I assume that um, one of my colleagues will forget the box of uh, supplies. So or the participants I, will be pissed off for a reason. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I always assume that there's someone in the room who's going to try to make my day extremely hard. <laughs> and if you almost mentally plan for it all to go horribly wrong, I, I think I guess that's the stoic philosophy, yeah. um, then you're not surprised. Then, uh, like mm -hmm. when I did a, a workshop recently in January when I was allowed to travel, um, you know, the, the, a couple of the people in the room were pretty aggressive and, you know, actually uh, 10 or 11 more people turned up than were expected, but it was really fun. And I loved the two days. And at the end, we all had a great time because I wasn't stressed and I wasn't overwhelmed. So I think mm -hmm. just in your mind, get rid of the fact that the workshop needs to be perfect and that you need to be on your perfect level. Honestly, yeah. Some of the best workshops I've run were when I was super sick, super tired, and uh, none of the supplies turned up. <laughs> you know, it reflects to me a terminology from the, the psychology, which is called narcissi narcissistic readiness, which mm. describes exactly that thing. Perfect. Thank you I so much. That. I didn't, I've never heard yeah, of that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Fantastic. I feel really, really much more... Uh, wealth in terms of information now and try to cool. do things. Uh, but I also have a couple of questions in the rest of uh, six minutes we do have about mm -hmm. the current situation. So I want you to do uh, for me to pick a, a, an object from your office or wherever that which will symbolize the coronavirus. Can you pick something? Uh, let's, that's around me right now? Yes, yes, whatever. Uh, it's let's symbol have a look. Symbolically, it's not uh, literally. Symbolically... <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, this here, uh, my microphone stand. Perfect. So, oh, this is coronavirus. Perfect. Now I want you to hold this thing. I want you to hold coronavirus and take change roles. And yeah. you become the coronavirus, okay? Okay. So I Hello. want to interview you as coronavirus. Hello, okay. coronavirus. How hey, are how's you? it going? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, two, just two questions. The first question is why, why, why did you came and did you uh, uh, jump into people's life? I think um, that the world was getting too focused on unimportant things. And I think you, you guys all needed to start thinking about, you know, what's important, family, friends, um, and not just being obsessed with making money and, you know, having wars and everything. So I think I just, I needed to make something that would bring people together in a horrible way. <laughs> okay. And, and in a positive why, way. Why now? Why now? Um, 
Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think. For, I, I think uh, the reason I did it now was uh, the there was just so much pointless stuff going on. You know, like you know, you have Trump. You have like the everyone fighting each other on the internet all the time. Just like really pointless, stupid stuff reached an absolute peak. Um, and something real needed to happen to get people into a different mindset. Okay, and the last question is, uh, my dear coronavirus, what <laughs> do you ask, what do you want from people in order to get to live and uh, go back to your place? I don't know where do you live, but go back to your place and uh, leave, us, leave us alone. <laughs> I think, um, I think, well... That's a very tricky question, but I, I'll try. Um, <laughs> what I need uh, is for people to stop focusing on nothing else but money and mm -hmm. just like stepping on other people so that they can get as much money as possible and um, that people actually come together and realize we're all in it together. <laughs> Then I'll go away. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Commissioner Coronavirus. <laughs> and, the, and the last, last question. From the whole am I Coronavirus Commission. now or am I Jonathan? No, 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 you're Jonathan. Okay. <laughs> change, change roles. You're, so, you're Jonathan. It's someday in the future, Jonathan, when the, the story of AJ uh, and uh, your industry probably will be recorded in a book of history. Okay. How would you like the current chapter to be named? What would be the title? Huh. Um, transition. Transition. Perfect. <laughs> so that was it. Thank you so much. Oh wait, I want to change the name of the. Ca I want to ch change the name of the chapter. Uh, <laughs> oh, because I'm, yes. I'm 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 going to steal the name from another book. Uh, the name of the okay. chapter would be "The Obstacle Is the Way." The obstacle is the way. Perfect message, I think. Cool. So really enjoy it, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you so much, Fasilis. It was really cool. Um, I, yeah. I just want to say Greece is like my favorite country on the entire planet. Myself and my wife have visited a million really? times and love I love Athens. I love Souflaki. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's amazing. So I will take the advantage of the of this interview and I will invite you officially. I had Great. a chat with Penny about a year ago uh, from Great. AJ. To, to come here and to run a uh, Design Spring Masterclass or, or another workshop where we will see the, the, the soonest the flights will uh, be back. Okay. Great. Perfect. So it will be great to, to have you here. Let's okay, get John. over there and have yes. some, uh, have some, what is it? Ra Raki? <laughs> Raki? You know, Raki actually is from Crete, where I come from. Ah, Crete, cool. Crete Island. Yeah. I was in Crete uh, last May and it was unbelievably beautiful. Oh, wow. Really Good. beautiful. Great, yeah. great. Originally, where do you come from? I'm from Ireland. Ireland. I yeah. love Ireland. It's Ireland is, is also lovely. I think the Irish yes. and the Greek uh, people yeah, get, very, get together very, very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> True. Perfect, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Stay safe and keep Stay inspiring us and sharing very, very nice stuff that you prepare for us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.